Good morning. Um, you're all very welcome to Trinity College Dublin, to the School of Physics, and to this room. This is the Schrodinger Lecture Theatre. So, Erwin Schrodinger, have you heard about him yet this morning? You have? So, did, you heard from Professor Finch about who he was, and did he tell you about the amazing story of this room? Did he tell you about Erwin Schrodinger predicting uh, the molecule of life in this room? Did you hear that? Yeah, so it's, uh, I'm getting nods on shaking so <laughs> maybe not everyone was awake for the first lecture but I, I think this is a special place and it's a special place to do physics it's a special place to learn physics it's a special place to teach physics and so since 1999 when I started here in Trinity College which I'm guessing is probably the year before most of you were born is that right yeah maybe two years before you were born god so um that's when I started my time here at Trinity and I started uh, here as an undergraduate student in uh, the physics and chemistry of advanced materials. It's now called it has nanoscience as part of the, uh, the branding now. Because when I was a student, nanoscience was still very, very much in its infancy. So um, I was lucky enough then to pursue a PhD. That's a, a second degree. It's a research degree. And I did that with uh, Professor Jonathan Coleman here at the School of Physics in Trinity College. And after that, I went to London for a few years and I worked as a research scientist over in Imperial College London, right next to the, the History Museum, the Natural History Museum. And I came back then four years ago to start a lectureship here at Trinity. And so one of the things that I really enjoy doing in uh, my, my, my job is I like teaching physics and I like teaching physics with props and with pieces of experimental apparatus because physics is an experimental science. So what does that mean? So if you think about what is science, right? So if I were to ask you what do you think science is, right? If you think about the process of science, right? What would you think it is? Can I ask somebody here to give me a suggestion? What do you think science is? I don't like I'm not looking for a definition or anything like that. Just I've kind of what what things come to your head? What do you think? Figure stuff out, exactly. So that, that's really important. So we want to know the world. And that's for all of the sciences, right? And physics is looking perhaps at uh, one particular element of, of the world. So how do we figure things out in science? What do you guys think over here? Somebody have, what do you think? Sorry. How do we figure things out in science? Trial and error. Trial and error, yeah, okay, so we do things. Experiment. Great, you said the magic word, perhaps prompted by your friend sitting next to you. But do you know what? Sometimes when I ask undergraduate students that question, they don't use that magic word. Experiment is the key to physics. It's what makes us different to just saying, sure, I have a theory about that. Sure, the Earth's flat because I, you know, I can't see the horizon bending over, so like, there you go. I have proof. Or I can predict the way the summer as weather is going to go by the movement of some weird bird in a bush, according to a postman in Donegal. And you go, well, that's fine, but that's a belief. That's not science. Science is something that's based on experiment. So we observe the world. We then make a hypothesis about what's going on. Then we do tests, trial and error. We do experiments. And then what do we do? After we've done the experiment, what happens next? So somebody up, up in this section here. What do you think? What comes after the experiments? Uh, well, hopefully, if you're, if you're very lucky. So, so once you've done the experiment, what do you have to do before you, you, you publish it? Uh, yeah, but how, what, like you're, you're making an assumption here that the experiment has gone well, right? How do you know if the experiment is, is right or not? Uh, analysis, yeah. What does somebody here say? Results, Results what does that mean? So are you saying that it needs to line up with what you thought might happen? Yeah, so that's your hypothesis testing. And so with this series of testing things and going back and forth and back and forth, science is never linear. Science is a big jumble of confusion and you banging your head against your desk or your lab bench because it didn't do what you thought it was going to do and you're going crazy and then you realise, oh, hang on a minute, that might mean this and then you go down a route and this is like... You do more experiments, you find more things out, and then all of a sudden you have a whole new explanation for the way something works, right? But let's think about that process of science as we think about something very, very everyday, right? So 
Let me ask you a question. How can you hear me? Okay, yeah. Right, particles traveling through the air. So, but um, okay, let me let me ask you guys again. If you were to explain to a very intelligent alien, right, who's just landed, but they don't have all of the scientific uh, language that you guys have learned in school, and you wanted to tell them how you can hear, right, uh, what would you say to them? With your ears. Okay, yeah, that's <laughs> excellent. Okay, yeah. No, about to remove the, 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 the science language, right? How do you hear, right? So, anyone else have another comment? So, with your ears, it's very, very good, right? Because it's extremely obvious, right? You hear with your ears. But let me ask you maybe a more fundamental question. What am I doing to allow you to hear something? I'm speaking, yeah, okay. So, I'm making noise or sound, right? And so, like, you did correctly identify, many of you, how that sound moves out into the air. So, sound, right, you think about, what's this? Tuning fork, yeah. So, um, let's, let's just, we all know what to do with it, right, so let's just have a go with it. <laughs> I'm going to back up, don't worry. Okay. So, if I were to ask you to make an observation uh, based on what you just heard, and you, well, maybe some of you saw something, but what would you say? Did you see them move? Oh, <laughs> how do you know that then? So, they're making noise. You're making an assumption that they're moving to do that, are you? Okay, so well, what did you observe? So it, as, a, in a, as a scientist, right, if I were your, your, your supervisor, I'd be like, I have no evidence that they're moving from, like, from what you said. You know from intuition that they move, right? But make an observation, right? Yeah. Pardon? Okay, so I hit this off my elbow, so I caused it, I gave it some sort of movement, right? and then it vibrated, so it moves back and forth. What causes the sounds? Wave. No, wave describes the sound. What causes the sounds? Vibration. Vib vibration of what? Particles. Particles. What, what are particles? <laughs> <laughs> Come crazy now. <laughs> when you come to first year, if you give me definitions that I hear from Newton Service, I take away marks. Um, so what, what are, what's causing the vibration? The metal, yeah. And what causes the sound? The vibration of? The metal, no. The air. The air, yeah. So the, the space between the tuning fork prongs moves in and out, right? That causes the air around it to move, right? With some sort of a periodic or repeated motion. So it goes in, out, in, out. And it causes the wave, or sorry, the air around it to do that contraction business as well, contraction and expansion. And that moves out into the room until it reaches what? Your ear, yeah. And what's your, what, how does your ear hear? Uh, bones, yeah, kind of, okay, I'm not a biologist, so I realize this being recorded, so this could come back and uh, bite me, but uh, <laughs> let's, let's uh, my, my, my idea, right, of it is that you have an ear drum right and the drum is very taut and that drum is able to vibrate and it vibrates when um when air hits off it right so you everyone puts your hand up in front of your mouth right let's do it okay come on yeah right if you want to be scientists you have to be extremely experimental right and everyone say the letter p for me p right you feel as you do that right do it again p yeah you feel the air hitting your, your, um, your hand, right? So you can feel that pressure wave. And so that's what sound is, is a, a periodic pressure wave that is incident on your eardrum, causes your eardrum to vibrate. Then that vibration through the magic of biology and your brain interprets it uh, as, as a, like a signal, right? And it says that signal corresponds to noise, right? And uh, the way that the air moves, uh, oh yeah, this is a great question actually. 
So when, when sound moved from my voice to you, right, does the, like, so how do you describe that movement, right? There's a wave, a waveness to it, right? But do the particles from my voice travel all the way to your ear? No. What travels to your ear? The, the, yeah, so the vibe, so the, the wave travels to your ear. So let's let's have a look at how that might be. If you take your fingers off the front bench from me there. Thanks, and you hold that. Right. Thank you. Okay, so imagine this is this is air, right? Um so it, uh, like we, we know we can describe air, it's like it's dense or it's not so dense, right? We can, we can model it first. And so imagine I'm talking down here, that's my voice box. I send the wave back and forth. It so happens this one's reflecting of this lady's hands, right? If I do it, let me just right, okay. see it move. Right. There we go. It comes back. So if I do it periodically, this is how sound is moving, right? Now I'm intentionally making the wave move in the same direction as the uh, variation from rest, right? You can also make waves go like that. That's not how sound waves move, right? That's the way next to waves move. Right? Maybe if we time it again, we can talk a little bit more about Mexican waves. I get my first year students to calculate how long will it take a Mexican wave to travel around Croke Park, right? If any of you are interested in doing that, you can find me on Twitter, send me an answer, and I'll tell you what I think of your answer and whether it agrees with the, the one that my students are. So let's talk a little bit more about how magic our ears are, how sound moves, and what properties or how we can, what language we can use to describe sound. So, um, the, the, the one thing about uh, physics is we have loads of great toys, right? So we like, and we should absolutely get stuck in and use them, right? So when you're in school, the best way to learn physics is to get the equipment out and have a go with it, right? Like as you're thinking about how stuff works, measure things. And you will understand things better through making measurements and building your own understanding. Don't read the book, right? Read the book as a guide. Don't believe the book. Believe your eyes and believe your ears. Do your own experiments. So. Okay, so we can hear something. generator so it's making that sound right I won't get into the details of how it does that but it's making a sound right um, a particular sound a particular note kind of would you say that's a higher or low note lowish okay so it's moving it's telling the speaker to make the note so it's telling the speaker to move 123 times every second right so the speaker here right they can actually put my finger on it right the speaker moves in and out and in and out it moves in and out 123 times every second that causes a wave of sound to reach your ears that causes your eardrums to move 123 times every second. And so we interpret that as a low note. The amount of movement that the eardrum goes through is uh, related to how loud it is. So I have a device in front of it called a microphone, right? And so you can see there I'm tapping the microphone. It's just a little handheld mic. It's up in front of the speaker. And because I'm a physicist and I want to understand a little bit about the nature of that sound that's coming out of the microphone, 
into this device, which is called an oscilloscope. So I'm able to look at how the signal that the microphone is receiving changes with time, right? So time is on the flat axis, or the x-axis here, and the signal for the microphone is on this axis, on the, the up-down or y-axis. So let me just make this a little bit more stable. Okay, so how would you, what would you say about that signal? What's the shape though? Wave shape, great. Okay, perfect, there's a wave shape too. Anyone here like mathematics? What's the function? No? I didn't realize this until I came to college, actually didn't make this connection. What's the shape? No? Have you done trigonometry yet? It's the sine function, right? So if you were to plot, if you were to plot, but we do. If you are to, you can even, these days you can Google it, right? So, there's uh, x, right? If you plot sine of x, right? That's the function, sine x. You just make a graph of sine x. That's it, right? So, this, this shape of a wave is a sine wave, right? So, sounds have this sine wave shape to it. Now, I, I'm going to adjust the pitch or the, the frequency of the note. I want you to observe what happens to the, the, uh, the screen here. Right, so let's, let's have a look. So, which one? Pitch goes up. See how squashed they are now? So we're very close to the frequency that's most annoying to our ears, right? Because of the shape of your ear. We won't get into that. This is a really annoying noise. Would you agree? Yeah, okay. 
So if I go even higher, now it's three and a half thousand times, okay, let me. Okay, can everyone still hear that? Okay, so everyone puts one hand in the air, and I just say, right, when you can't hear it anymore, take your hand down. Now just remember, when you take your hand down, you might not be the only person, you might be the only person in the room who can't hear it anymore. You just, shh, shh, we want to see if you can hear the highest uh, frequency, right? I realize this is experimentally sensitive. Those of you sitting right in front of the speaker, you're at, this, you're, you're at an advantage compared to those over there, right? Okie dokie. So that's 10,000 hertz. So the speaker is now moving 10,000 times per second, moving so fast that I can't, I can't really figure that out from, I can't feel that. Let's go higher and higher and higher. Lovely. So, right. I can't hear that anymore. Anyone, can you all, can you hear that? Can you hear that? <laughs> I just pumped up the volume big time there. So um, that's 15,000 times per second. You can all hear that. So that's 20,000 now. Okay, so anyone who can hear higher than that, you're like, that's into dog territory. So like, it's super hard. It's super hard. You can hear these extremely high frequencies. So you can see, if you can see on the screen, it is still playing. It's extremely high uh, frequencies. It's very, very squashed. The reason you actually blow is your ears are not very sensitive to allow the device to, to those high frequencies. So let me just prove that it's still going by turning the frequency down. You can also hear that. Amazing. Okay. Okay, so what happens now if I get two waves of sound, right? And okay, so that's you can, you can see that there. So that's that's a very um, that's a note. So what happens when I put on two sources of sound, right? So one is 184. Now I'm putting on this second one. And it's 100 and 180. So one is playing one note and the other is playing different notes. They're very similar. But what do you hear? So what do you observe? The fluctuation. Yeah, what are we going to say? Pulsing. Yeah, exactly. So, if I were to play one note on its own, it would just hear it like, ooh. If I play another one, it would just be like, ooh. Slightly lower, right? But they won't. <laughs> yes, I am weird. Uh, <laughs> they, uh, <laughs> come to college, you can explore your own weirdness. It's like, <laughs> don't record that bit. But, uh, <laughs> um, so you can hear a pulse, right? But two of them, I like, play one on its own, it's steady, play the other on its own, it's steady. Play the two of them together, you hear a pulse. Why? What do you see on the screen? Exactly it. So the one wave is moving slightly out of phase with the other, right? And it catches up every so often, and every so often then it, it's lagging behind. And so at different points, right, you see it's kind of it's really loud, and other points in the cycle it's very quiet. So sometimes the two waves add up and make a louder wave, and sometimes the waves cancel each other and make no sound. So if I were to be so you can observe it there, right? So you can see it goes from effectively nothing to quite a high sound. And if I just do one on its own, there's one on its own there, right? Steady. And then one on its own down here. 
here. It's the same one. But together, they have this do 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 business, right? So this is called beating, right? If you're ever on an airplane and hear this, you should probably raise your hand to tell the, um, the, the air steward or air stewardess, right? Because this is a problem for, for uh, airplanes. These two engines, right? They, have, they each have a frequency that they hum at when they're flying, but if they're slightly out of tune with each other, they cause this beating. And it can cause, it's not going to crash an airplane, but the pilots are conscious of it. They have to tune the engines so they both make the same noise at the same frequencies. A friend of mine did physics, is now working for a she told me she, she told me she's a pilot, she does this every day when she's flying. So um, if you make the difference between the two frequencies even smaller, right? Now, what do you observe? Yeah, but compared to the old one, it takes more time. So the beat frequency is smaller, right? So if I make the difference bigger, you can actually see the two waves now. They're hardly interfering anymore. Now what do you see? instruments are, I'm going to focus with the concert hall and let's do the music here, where we look at the, the massive overlap between music, maths and, uh, and physics, right? Loads of people who work here in the School of Physics are, are, um, who are students here are, are big into music as well, right? Because I think it's something to do with symmetry, right? We like patterns. We like seeing those patterns. We're pretty good at figuring out what those patterns are, and so that makes us into music or into maths. Those, all those things are kind of very, very similar uh, in your head. So, um, I can really describe though the way some very simple musical instruments work. So, if you think about a big stringed instrument like a guitar, right? Like, pluck it, right? And depending on the, the setup, which I brought up with the ukulele, um, depending on where you pluck it, you'll get like different notes, right? And so, how if you have a, and who plays a guitar here? Right, so how do you, if you have the, the bottom E string, right, and you pluck that, how do you make it fit higher in pitch? Move it up the car. What do you do to the string? Shorter, yeah, you would take that movement there. You're making it short. If you want to just increase the note on the guitar without changing the length, you could make it tighter. How do you do that? Yeah, you just increase the tension. Tension goes up, pitch goes.
So um, here I have my trusty guitar string model, and I'm going to send through it a periodic uh, pulse. Right? So when I pluck the string, wave pulse travels all the way down, and it gets to the end, it reflects back. Right? So what happens if I, I, like, so if I were to take a very tight string and pluck it, it would do that a number of times. It would set up a wave on the string, and that wave then makes noise, causes the guitar body to vibrate, goes to your ear. But let's see what, what the shapes of those, these things are. So, very simple plucking device here. Come on. It's hard to get it going. Takes a little bit of that. Okay, you'll see now, right? Haha, I've done it. So, Right, so what I'm, what I'm doing here is I'm sending pulses down the wave, they're coming back, and you see there are parts of this wave where it's moving a lot and parts where it's not moving at all. Right, so I get these patterns, right? And depending on, on how frequently I pluck the string, right, I can, I can get different patterns. So you can see clearly there in the center, right, there's no movement, right? But yet over here, there's a lot of movement. This is a reflected wave, it's called a standing wave, right? It's, really not what it's, called. it's called a standing wave. And depending on the setup, I can get different multiples of, of, of these stationary points along the wave. They're called harmonics. This is how you get that right. So the different, different instruments put out different types of harmonics, and that really does define their, their musical personality. So let's go even faster. So now you'll see there are three. Uh, areas of a lot of movement and two points, or sorry, one, two, three, four points where there's no movement. So here, 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 and here, right? So that's a harmonic. So, right, we're going to use show lights. If anyone can like that kind of thing, show your eyes then. So, you're going to be in charge of show lights, right? So, put it on there, right? It's not like you can just hit it. No students were, were harmed in making this. Okay, so on with the strobe lights. Okay, now so what the strobe does, right? Well, it's not very dark here. But what the strobe does is it, it, it only lights up a fraction of the uh, of the, the periodicity, right? So what you're able to do is, right, you're able to kind of observe things that are moving very quickly uh, in a slow down frame. So you can see here. You just see the wee turning knob in the bottom. So you just adjust that. Thank you. Right, so you can, what's your name? Sorry. Aaron is illuminating part of the uh, the wave here. So what he's able to show is some of the wave. He's able to show the waves that are traveling in one direction or the other. Right. So you turn it now. He's able to light up part of that standing wave. So Armin, you point to that a, a bit, uh, further, little down, further, further down the wave. You see here, there's not much movement at all, right? Just call it a nose. Now, back down here, you see this, oh, this thing has a mind of its own. So, see there are certain points where it's moving a lot, and they're anti nodes. Okay, all right, I'm getting half minded here, so you can switch that off. Thank you. I'll leave it on for a second. pretty cool, isn't it? So this is exactly the way your guitar works, right? Um, and of course, guitars are based on string, right? But what about other sorts of instruments? Um, so what's the other big family of instruments? Uh, brass and woodwind and all those ones. So what, they don't have, they don't have a string in them. What, how do they produce sound? Vibrations of the air, just that's the way a string produces the sound. How does a brass instrument or, or a woodwind instrument produce the sound? The reeds, 
Yeah, but what? It's not the reed that's making the sound. It's the. It's the what? It's the column, right? So it's this. It's this cylinder, right, that makes the sound, right? So you can set up waves like that within the cylinder. Right? It's hard to demonstrate them, obviously. So if I play the note, excuse me, I don't play the tin whistle, right? How do I make it higher in pitch? Pardon? Yeah, it could blow harder, right? But, uh, but um, that, that is, uh, that's right. So how, using my fingers. Lift the last finger up, what am I doing? <laughs> so what am I doing? I'm, I'm making, I'm, what am I adjusting? What am I adjusting when I, when I change the pitch? The length, thank you, of the pipe, right? So the length of the pipe is important for the, the note you hear. Look carefully at this. Long pipe. Short pipe. Stuck pipe. <laughs> Predict the last note. Oh, it's not in tune, that's horrible. So, you, you saw as the popping pipes got shorter, the pitch went up. And I can get those harmonics that I got with the, the uh, taut string, also with a cylinder of air, right? So if I whirl this, right? There's, you hear the, hear the low note? I have to go quite slowly to get it. Can you hear it? Now if I go faster, right? Because you like plucking the string faster, I can hear the harmonics. So if you listen, Actually, there's a video of that last lecture doing something like this. Um, when mobile phones started getting cameras first, the students decided they'd take a video of it, and they added, oh, do you know Bee Gees music too? Because it looked like he was, he was doing the, uh, the old Bee Gees music. So, uh, yeah, uh, it's, it's a YouTube sensation. So um, before I finish, I want, to, uh, I want to show you one more thing. Oh, yeah, so two more things. So in, in, a, in an organ, uh, or like, this device here, right? <laughs> right? Now, worried that thousands of physicists have, like, wrapped their lips around the top of that, like, God knows what I'm going to contract from it, but I, I was trying to demonstrate to you that, again, by varying the length of the column, I'm able to change the pitch, right? And so when you see a church organ, right, which is basically tons of these things, right, made from wood, made from metal, made from, I don't know what else they're made from, they, they all are different length, they're made from different materials, so they give a different sort of a, a flavour to the note, and obviously a different pitch. So, um, if you come to college here in a few years, I think um, that you'd be making a great decision to choose a, um, a degree in physics or in science or in nanomaterials, or even theoretical physics, right? Um, they're, the great thing about coming to college to do these things is you get to learn by doing experiments and by having ideas and having notions and you build your own understanding, right? So you construct, and I use that word intentionally, you construct your own interpretation of the world using science. You become scientists, right, from the day you start as an undergraduate student. And so the skill you have is your ability to do experiments, to get that data, to interpret it in terms of what you're your hypothesis was at the start, and for you to, to, to build on that and construct a model of the world, right? So when people say, homeopathy, it works, you're like, let's see your data, right? Um, or, you know, don't, vaccine, don't vaccinate your, your child, um, they, they might get whatever, they're like, I don't think there's any evidence to show that. Or, climate change, it's real, this is the evidence, this is how I interpret it, this is what it means, right? You guys can be, uh, can be trained, you guys can be educated in, in how to interpret data and how to use that to understand the world. And finally then, let me show you this. So this is a campaign I ran last
last year. It's called uh, City of Physics, and we ran this campaign. Can you all see it? You can. Let me turn down the light a little bit. We ran this last year uh, in the city centre, uh, where we we put uh, adverts on the Dart train, adverts on the Dublin bus, and even on the traffic lights. Uh, boxes around the city, right? So this, this uh, is all about Moore's Law and the way circuits and uh, computational components have gotten smaller over the last 50 years. You can play with this yourself, have a look. We had a mural above the arts block entrance. It only lasted 24 hours because of a big storm. Um, and this mural here is talking about the fact that we're all made of stardust. So all the elements in your body, apart from one, hydrogen, has come from the death of a star. Right, that stars and are, are basically the giant engines of matter in the universe. It's where small elements or, or light elements are fused into heavier ones. And so we, we explored that idea talking, and we worked with artists here to think about Dublin being made up of stardust. And finally, let me show you what I think was our best component of the, of the project. We showed an almost live image of the sun uh, from uh, an observatory called it's not the Soho one, it's, do you remember the name of the, the observatory that NASA used? SDO, Solar Dynamics Observatory, that's it. So it's a NASA European Space Agency um, device that's in space and it's looking at the sun and that data is being used by lots of my colleagues and thousands of other scientists around the world to understand the sun and understand its weather. But I think it looks pretty, right? And uh, the sun is a dynamic place, the sun is a very interesting place. And so I thought, why not just put a projection of the sun up in the city centre and let Dubliners see the beauty of physics. And so let me show you a very short video of what that looked like. to Professor McGuinness, but if not, I'll, I'll just say thank you very, very much for your attention, and um, lovely to speak to you this morning. Thank you. Thank you.